and Don Lewis coming to you from beautiful Salem. Join me for our World of Witches Museum tour. Come, walk with me. No, really, come with me. <laughs> We've always known that magic goes back at least as far as written history because many of the first things we wrote about were magical. But archaeology has shown us that magic goes back much farther than this. Most people know about the Neanderthal, who are the kind of humans who come before modern humans, and that they already had magical beliefs and practices, especially respecting the burial of their dead, their apparent beliefs in the afterlife, and the shrines and temples that they built to their deities, who they appear to have worshipped in animal form, particularly cave bears. But archaeology also has shown us that even before the Neanderthal, humankind already had magical practices. In fact, the earliest known magical artifacts go back more than 150,000 years to the Homo erectus people who come before the Neanderthal. We know about the magical beliefs and practices of the Homo erectus people primarily from the cave of Lazare in France, where they've discovered many remains of Homo erectus people, including a late era settlement that dates to about 150,000 years ago and includes a number of dwellings. And at the entryway to each of these dwellings is a very carefully positioned wolf skull. Now, the wolf skull is not part of the architecture of the dwelling, nor is it just littered around as if it were the remains of their last wolf meal, but it's very carefully positioned at the entryway, and from the position of modern witchcraft, we would assume that this is a house guardian, that it was put there to spiritually protect the people who lived within, and modern witches still use house guardians today. In fact, we have one for our museum, and his name is George, and he's right behind me. Hello, George. Another early magical artifact are the cave paintings of Europe. In Europe, the cave paintings go back between 10,000 and 30,000 years ago. And they're generally believed to have been done for magical purposes. They're not in the parts of caves where people live. They're located very deep inside and often in places that are very hard to get to, which is why we're fairly certain they were not done just for decoration. Here on our walls, you'll see reproductions of famous cave paintings. These uh, to my left are from Altamira in Spain. These to my right are a montage of themes from the caves of Lascaux in France. And as you can see, they mostly represent animals and hunting scenes, and most people believe that they were a form of hunting magic, that the ancient people would paint the successful hunt they hoped to have, or the kind of animals they'd like to see increase, and then they would have done a magical ceremony to empower the painting and draw it into the physical world, much as witches still use image magic today. There is, however, a second theory about the cave paintings, and that is that the shamans, or the witches of the ancient tribes, went deep into the caves to have their visions, and then painted their visions on the walls, either to record them, or again to draw them into the physical world. Nobody knows which of these two theories is true, of course, because they're all dead. And although there are those of us who talk to the dead, these dead have been dead a long, long time. As we come forward, you will see Les Sorcières. This is a reproduction of Les Sorcières. And Les Sorcières comes from the cave of Trois Frères in France, and the original is said to be about 13,000 years old. At one time, it was the most famous of all cave paintings, because as you can see, it does not represent something that they saw walking about in the real world, but is an abstract image that combines parts of a human being with one or more animals. And therefore, it's one of the earliest known abstract images, and it's also by many people believed to be the earliest known painting of a god or spirit uh, in human history. Many people believe it represents the ancient god of the hunt or the god of the forest, uh, and therefore is one of the earliest of all human references uh, to spirituality caught in paint. Other people, however, believe that this represents a shaman in the act of shape-shifting. Shape-shifting is the idea that a person can go from being a human to being an animal. This is not intended to be a physical transformation, but rather as a spiritual transformation. And what happens is that the shaman would go into a light trance, the shamans believe that they can leave their body in a spiritual form, that the spiritual form can then take any form that they would wish to be. And uh, this is the origin of legends about werewolves, for example, and also the legend of witches flying through the air on brooms or other items that do not normally fly. It's believed that these represent this sort of shamanic journeying or astral travel, uh, which is also believed to be represented by Les Sorcières. As we come forward, you will see our Venus figures. The Venus figures date generally between about 5,000 and about 30,000 years ago, and they're believed to be depictions of the ancient mother goddess, the goddess of the earth, the goddess of the life force, uh, the great mother goddess of all existence. This is the most famous of them, the Venus of Willendorf, 
And our reproductions of these figures are all made by Oberon Zell Ravenheart, and you can find them at uh, his website, mythicimages.com, if you'd like one of your own. Uh, but uh, this is the most famous of all the Venuses, the Venus of Willendorf. And as you can see, she's portrayed as a rather stout lady. Some people believe she's intended to be pregnant. Some people believe she's not. And she has no face. And uh, many people have thought that the ancient people simply did not know how to do a face. But uh, as you can see for our next example, the Venus of Dona Vestonica, uh, they definitely did know how to do a face. This figure uh, was found at Dona Vestonica, as was the face. And they were found in the same general area. They were definitely done at the same time. In fact, it's believed that the woman in the portrait is actually the artist who made the figure. And they believe this because they found the body, which has the offset jaw corresponding to the portrait. And it appeared to be a shaman and also an artist uh, who had made many of these figures. So you can see, once again, the figure of the Venus uh, is a stout woman who may or may not be pregnant and has no face. Our third figure is the Venus of the Spook. And as you can see, once again, the same basic characteristics, including the absence of a face. And it's believed that the reason she does not have a face is that she does not represent a person, but rather a deity, uh, a cosmic power, if you would. And as you can see, they all, they all resemble each other, but they vary, and they're found all the way from England in the west to Siberia in the east, all the way from northern Europe down into the Mediterranean over the course of several thousand years. Now, some people have suggested that they don't actually represent a goddess, but perhaps are a kind of prehistoric pinup. Uh, however, the temples at Malta are the most exalted versions of this particular goddess, one of which uh, is missing its head, but is about nine feet tall without the head. And she is at the very center of the great temple, which rather does suggest that, yes, indeed, it is a goddess. And now we come to our first big exhibit, history's first great archetypal witch, the goddess Isis of ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, Isis was the goddess of magic, and also of motherhood and life itself, because to the Egyptians, all of these things were linked. In Egyptian thought, the act of giving birth was the most magical thing a human being could do, because it brought new life into the world. Therefore, they thought of women as being inherently more magical than men, which has been a pretty universal assumption throughout most of human history. In ancient Egypt, if you look at the tombs, in men's tombs, they're commonly shown with their wives or their mothers or even their daughters in the hope that the magic of the women will help them to be reborn. But when women have their own tombs, they're not necessarily shown with anyone else because they have the magic inside them. In ancient Egyptian religion, when her husband Osiris was murdered by his brother Set, Isis used this same inherent magic to bring him back to life. And when she had brought him back to life, he stayed with her for a number of years, and they had together a child by the name of Horus, whom they raised to adulthood. And then, when he had accomplished this, Osiris went on into the afterlife, where he became the king of the dead. And in ancient Egypt, everyone hoped that when they died, they would go to the kingdom of Osiris for their afterlife. Now, on one side of our little vignette, you will see the god Anubis, who was the guardian of the tomb, who watched over the dead, and who helped them into the spirit world. And on the other side, you'll see Toth, who presided over the weighing of the soul. Because the Egyptians believed that when they reached the kingdom of Osiris, their soul in the form of their heart would be weighed against a feather, the symbol of truth. And if their heart was lighter than a feather, they would be let in. But if it was not lighter than a feather, they would not be let in. And so, in ancient Egypt, magic was thought of as a very positive thing. Isis herself was regarded as a very positive goddess and much loved by Egyptians. In fact, she was the most popular of all Egyptian goddesses. And later, was not only popular in Egypt, but also in Greece and Rome as well. In fact, there have been temples to Isis found as far north as Roman London. And still today, Isis is perhaps the most popular goddess in the Western world and is the patron goddess of many modern witches. And the Fellowship of Isis, which is dedicated to Isis of 10,000 names, is perhaps the world's largest goddess spirituality organization in the world today. And on the wall behind us, you will see our biography of Lady Olivia Robertson, the founder and head of the Fellowship of Isis. These three ladies are our stereotypes. And as you can see, we have very happy, smiley stereotypes in here, as opposed to the nasty, snarly stereotypes out in the real world. These three ladies represent the two stereotypes that modern witches most often find themselves contending against. The green-faced Halloween witch and the three witches from Macbeth. Now, the green-faced Halloween witch is a very modern stereotype. It actually only goes back to the Wizard of Oz movie from the 1930s when they painted poor Margaret Hamilton green and accidentally set her on fire because the makeup was flammable. 
But she was a trooper, and when she got out of the hospital, she went back and finished that film, which is why we have green-faced Halloween witches today. Before that, although the color green was occasionally connected to witchcraft, it was not in the form of a skin color. There were no green witches before the Wizard of Oz, including in the Wizard of Oz, because in the original books, the witch was not green. The three witches from Macbeth, on the other hand, are a very old stereotype. Not only are they an old stereotype in the sense of being part of the legend of Macbeth, but many aspects of the stereotype are also very old. One of them is the fact they're shown as crones. And the crone is an image of the ancient Celtic goddess of winter and of death and of magic and of prophecy. But the three witches in Macbeth were not originally crones. And in the original legend of Macbeth, which goes back more than a thousand years, the three witches were actually three beautiful women who prophesied his rise to power. And it's believed that these three women represent the ancient Celtic mother goddess, who was commonly shown as three women at one time. There are other differences between the original story of Macbeth and Shakespeare's Scottish play as well, one of which is that Macbeth was considered a pretty good king in Scotland. In fact, he was so secure on his throne that he was able to make a pilgrimage to Rome and be gone for many months, come back and still be king, which was pretty good for a thousand years ago. Other aspects of, of the stereotype also have a historical origin, including the broom, which is actually used in magic, much as it's used in real life, for cleansing out negative energy and bringing in positive energy. The cauldron, which is an ancient symbol of the mother goddess and the principle of the life force and creation. And then, of course, we have the pointy black witch's hat. And people have looked for the origin of the pointy black witch's hat in the last 2,000 years of European history, but they've looked for it there in vain. Because in the last 2,000 years of European history, nobody ever wore a hat quite like this. There have been similar hats, including the pilgrim's hat, which is similar, but was not pointed, uh, and the henan, which was pointed, but which did not normally have a brim. So people came to think that the witch's hat had been created just for the stereotype. And some people thought that perhaps it was based on the dunce cap, or on the pointed hats worn in some branches of the Catholic Church, uh, or perhaps on the yellow hat that Jewish people were forced to wear in the Middle Ages. But archaeology has shown that none of these are the origin of the witch's hat, but that it actually does come from history. It's just more than 2,000 years ago. And uh, in Europe itself, they have found four golden witch hats, which are made of sheet gold. And they've been found in various parts of France, Germany, and Austria. And you can Google them as golden hat and see them for, for yourself. They're very much like our modern witch hat, except a little bit more um, exaggerated in size and proportion. And it's believed that they were worn by the priesthood of the ancient Urnfield culture, which is a proto-Celtic culture of Central Europe, for very formal occasions. Although I have to say, I pity the poor priestess who had to wear one because she would need some help balancing it. Archaeologists believe, however, that the golden hats represent a headgear that would normally have been made out of either cloth or leather, which would have been worn for normal occasions. However, because of the nature of the climate in Europe, they've never found a preserved example of that ordinary headgear in Europe. Oddly enough, however, in China in the last several decades, they've been finding mummies in the Tarim Basin of Mongolia, many of which are European. Three of them, who are known as the Witches of Subeishi, are wearing pointed black witches' hats almost identical to our modern stereotype, and they are believed to be priestesses of that same ancient culture. And the only difference is that their hats are a little bit taller than what we normally think of as a witch's hat. The brim is a little bit narrower, but otherwise, is clearly the origin of the stereotype. Now, we go on to our second stereotype. This is our second stereotype, Bob the Necromancer. We put a lot of thought into coming up with just the perfect name for our Necromancer, and we decided Bob was it. And as you can see, Bob is in the act of raising poor Uncle Morty from the dead, and Uncle Morty is not at all happy. And this represents the stereotype that many people have of witches doing black magic and unspeakable things in cemeteries late at night, which real witches do not do. Most people who consider themselves to be real witches belong to either the Wiccan religion or related religions such as Stregaria, uh, who have rules against this sort of thing. For one thing, we have the Wiccan Reed, which is do as you will but harm none. We also have the belief in karma, that what you do comes back to you. So we would not be raising poor Uncle Morty from the dead because we wouldn't want someone doing that to us. So Uncle Morty can rest in peace. Go ahead, Uncle Morty, rest in peace. And it doesn't matter how many times I tell him that, he never lays back down. Our third stereotype is much closer to what many people have faced historically if they were accused of witchcraft, which is persecution, imprisonment, or even death, whether they were actually practicing any form of witchcraft or not. This is Tichaba, the Witch of Salem, and many people believe that Tichaba was the only real witch in Salem at the time of the Salem Witch Hysteria. 
Tichuba was a slave woman. She was either African or Native American or a mixture of both, and she belonged to the local minister, was frequently set to watch over his children and other local children. Tichuba and her husband, John Indian, did do actual magic and divination, and depending upon your definition, they were definitely witches. Uh, among other things, Tichuba and her husband did protective rituals for the local neighbors. Uh, Tichuba also used divination, uh, not least to entertain the children she was watching over. And it was actually this that led to Tichuba being one of the first three women accused of witchcraft in the Salem witch hysteria. But, unlike the others who were accused, Tichuba, being a slave woman and accustomed to telling people what they wanted to hear, confessed that yes, she really was a witch. Not only did she tell them that she was a witch, but she proceeded to tell them that every paranoid fantasy they had ever had about witchcraft was absolutely true, including that she flew around on the back of a flying goat. Interestingly, the judges did not ask to see the flying goat. I would have thought you'd want to see a flying goat, but they did not. What they did do is find her guilty of witchcraft, throw her in jail, and then promptly forget that she existed. And so as the Salem witch hysteria went forward, 19 people were hanged, but Tichuba was never one of them. She lived through the entire witch hysteria, and in the end was released from jail when someone paid her fine. And nobody knows what happened to her after that. Some people say she went to Virginia. Some people say she went back to Barbados, where she came from in the first place. Other people feel that she's still here in Salem as a tutelary spirit, watching over the city as long as we never have another witch hunt. And as you can see, we've spared no expense in creating this elaborate replica of Stonehenge. And Stonehenge, of course, is the world's most famous metaphysical artifact, with the possible exception of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Everybody knows about Stonehenge, but they usually don't know much about it. Some of the things we do know about it is it was built by the megalith people of ancient Europe who built stone monuments throughout ancient Europe, and they built them in three main ways. They built simple standing stones, which are very large stones stood upright in the earth, sometimes in groups of hundreds. Uh, they built underground chambers like Newgrange in Ireland and the temples in Malta, and they built circular formations like Stonehenge and Woodhenge and Avebury and many others. Stonehenge itself is believed to have been begun about 10,000 years ago as a timber circle, and the stone circle we know today was begun about, th about 3,000 BC or about 5,000 years ago, and the last work is believed to have been done on it somewhere between 1200 and 1600 BC. And there are all kinds of theories about why they built Stonehenge. Some people believe that it was a temple, some people believe it was an astronomical observatory, some people believe it was a marketplace, and some people believe it was a landing pad for flying saucers. And it could have been all these things, we don't really know. But the latest theory about Stonehenge is it was originally part of a much larger ritual ground, and that there were many other buildings made of timber which have of course vanished over the centuries. And the current thought is that Stonehenge and a similar monument called Dorrington Walls were used in seasonal ceremonies, with Dorrington Walls being used in the summer for ceremonies honoring the living and the life force and the harvest, and Stonehenge being used in the winter for ceremonies honoring the ancestors and the spirit world. And if this is true, it's very interesting, because our modern wishes liturgical year is still divided in the same way, with the summer honoring the physical world and the life force, and the winter honoring the spiritual world and the ancestors. Next, we have the Oracle of Delphi. An oracle is a spirit message. It's also sometimes called aspecting, drawing down, messaging, mediumship. There are many different words for it, but it's a message from spirit usually attributed to a particular deity, to an ancestor, sometimes to the universe as a whole. And it's very much part of modern witchcraft. Uh, the foremost living oracle is Olivia Robertson, who we talked about back in the Icean Chamber. But historically, the most famous of all oracles is certainly the Oracle of Delphi. One reason for this is that the Oracle of Delphi was not a single woman, but an office that was held by many hundreds of women over the course of more than a thousand years that the Temple of Delphi had an oracle. And the oracle, by tradition, had to be at least 50 years old, and she was the chief priestess of the temple. And one day a month, in the warm months of the year, the oracle would give predictions, which is what she is famous for. And people could come from all over Greece and later the Roman Empire and ask any question they wished as long as they had made a suitable donation to the temple. And the oracle would go into a special chamber called the Anaton, where she would give her prophecies. Supposedly, there was a gas that came out of the earth at Delphi, and the Greeks knew this gas as pneuma, and they believed that it was the manifestation of deity. Today, many people believe that it was ethylene gas. And if you've ever inhaled ethylene gas, which hopefully you have not, you will know that it can do things to your consciousness. 
Supposedly, the oracle would inhale this gas, which would help her to go into her trance. She would then stare into a bowl of sacred water from the Holy Kasota Spring, and she would see visions. And in this way, she would answer people's questions. Some of her most famous prophecies include telling the Athenians, when the Persians were invading Greece, that they needed to hide behind a wall of wood, because their wall of stone would not protect them. And the Athenians correctly understood this to mean that they needed to use their wooden navy to fight an offensive battle, instead of trying to fight a defensive battle behind the stone city wall. And this is what they did, and they in fact won their encounter. She is also said to have told the Emperor Nero that the number 73 would mark his death, which he foolishly believed meant that he would live to be 73 years old and could do anything he wanted in the meantime, which he continued to believe up until the day the 73-year-old General Galba overthrew him. And the oracle's very last prediction was to the, to the Emperor Theodosius II. When he closed the Temple of Delphi in 393 AD, the very last oracle made her very last prediction of the Roman Empire itself would close soon after. And in fact, within about 20 years, the Western Empire had fallen. And then lastly, we have here our Tree of Life. And in the Tree of Life, you'll see all kinds of different life forms. Uh, ranging from little green men looking out through the foliage who represent spirits of nature to a variety of different creatures such as butterflies, uh, little monkeys, etc. And uh, it's our hope that eventually we'll have all kinds of different creatures in our tree because the tree of life symbolizes life itself. And of course the tree of life is very important in many of the world's different religions and it represents the idea that God, the universe, and everything are connected, that none of us is ever truly separate we're all one tree with many branches, part of the same life force. Now, we enter the witch maze. The first person in the witch's maze is Enheduanna. Enheduanna was a princess of ancient Akkad. She was the daughter of Sargon the Great. She was also the high priestess of the moon god Nana and a devotee of the goddess Ishtar. What she did that is significant is that she wrote many of the hymns and religious liturgy that were used in Mesopotamia for more than a thousand years after her death. And uh, she helped greatly with the process of syncretizing the Sumerian deities, such as Inanna, with the Semitic deities, such as Ishtar, to allow the Sumerian culture to continue forward as the population changed. However, the number one thing she did that is significant historically is that she is the very first author in all of human history to sign her work. And we thought that earned her a place at the head of our witch's maze. As we come around, you'll see a number of figures from antiquity, and then we come to Mother Shipton. And Mother Shipton is Britain's answer to Nostradamus. She was a witch who lived during the reign of King Henry VIII. And in her lifetime, she was most famous for predicting the death of Cardinal Wolsey, which most people did not see coming. And she also is identified with something called the Petrifying Well. Now, there are some people who feel that Mother Shipton was not an actual historical figure. There are others who say that she was, but she certainly is a part of British folklore. And the Petrifying Well is the first secular tourist attraction in British history. And Mother Shipton also is credited with many prophecies that became popular after her death. She's said to have prophesied the Great Fire of London, for example, and this was taken seriously by the royal family itself. There are also a number of collections of her prophecies, which are definitely forgeries that come from a later period, but are still interesting nonetheless. And here is Dr. John Dee, history's original 007. Uh, Dr. John Dee was the court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I. Among other things, he did the horoscope to set the date for her coronation. And he also instructed the Queen uh, in astrology and other things. In addition, he acted as a spy for the Queen, and as a spy, his code name literally was 007. When they created James Bond, they drew some inspiration from John Dee. John Dee was also famous as a ceremonial magician, and he created the Enochian system of magic. And of course, we can't very well have Mother Shipton and John Dee without having Nostradamus. And Nostradamus, of course, today is very famous for his collections of prophecies, which are very inscrutable and which are believed to have been done using horary astrology as well as forms of scrying or vision seeking. Uh, but in his lifetime, he was actually more famous as a physician for most of his life. Uh, later in life, he started to publish an annual almanac, which included his predictions, which made him very famous as a seer. The first prediction that really attracted attention was his prediction for the death of King Henry II, which was eerily accurate and attracted the patronage of the Queen of France, Catherine de' Medici. Among other predictions he made for the Queen were that three of her sons would become kings. And of course, when she received this prediction, the Queen believed 
that her eldest son would become the King of France, her second son the King of England, and her third son the King of Poland. As things actually worked out, all three sons successively became the King of France, and none of them had heirs who succeeded to the throne. Over here we have Charles Leland, and Charles Leland was the first modern figure to write about witchcraft as a religious movement. And during his lifetime, he was known actually for a very wide volume of work, uh, including his work as a philologist, and he's still very much respected as a philologist today. He also later wrote about Italian witchcraft in particular, which is called Stregoria. And his most significant book about Stregoria is the Aradia, or the Gospel of the Witches. And in this book, he gives the creation story of Italian witchcraft and many other uh, interesting details of belief, which he received from an Italian witch by the name of Maddalena Toluti. And this is Maddalena here, and he worked with her for a number of years to put together a, a, a collection of Italian folklore that came from the Stregaria. And uh, today it's believed that the different families of Strega uh, have different variations of this mythology, and so the Aradia represents uh, Maddalena's particular strain, uh, but it's a very significant publication in the development of modern witchcraft. And next to Charles Leland, you will see Lydia Beckett, who was one of his American disciples, who brought uh, this sort of witchcraft, which became known as Aradian witchcraft, to the United States. She also is well known for opening the first museum of magic and witchcraft in a religious sense, uh, the Lawrence Museum, which she and her daughter Atalo opened in 1937, which was open for more than 50 years. And you will see photos from inside the museum and I believe we might be the only place that actually has photos of the museum today. As we come around the corner, you'll see other figures from American witchcraft, including Caroline High Corral, and then we'll start to see figures from British witchcraft. Here we have Margaret Murray, and Margaret Murray was a highly respected Egyptologist. She worked, among other things, with Sir Flinders Petrie, and she was the curator of the Manchester Museum uh, Egyptian collection in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Among other things, she is credited with the first scientific unwrapping of a mummy, the autopsy of the so-called Two Brothers in 1903. Uh, Margaret Murray also, later in life, after retiring from Egyptology, wrote a series of books on witchcraft as the old religion of Europe, which were extraordinarily influential in the 1920s and 30s, and have a great deal to do with the modern witch revival. Margaret Murray also wrote her autobiography, which she entitled My First Hundred Years, when she was, in fact, 100 years old, and is an all-around very remarkable woman. Here we have Gerald Gardner, who's often considered the father of modern witchcraft because he was the first person to write about witchcraft and admit that he was himself a witch. Many people believe that people like Margaret Murray and Charles Leland, who were writing about witchcraft earlier, were also practitioners, but they never said so in their writings, uh, where Gardner was extremely clear that he himself was a witch. Uh, Gardner claimed to have learned witchcraft from a woman by the name of uh, Dorothy Clutterbuck, and you'll see her next to him. And Clutterbuck has been a very controversial figure. Many people for many years claimed that she did not exist at all. After it was proved that she did exist, many people have claimed that she was not actually a witch. But the writings of Mike Nichols have made pretty clear that she was, in fact, what Gardner said she was. Her diaries, which include hymns and uh, liturgy to pagan deities, really don't leave much question. Now, as we come around this corner, you'll start to see people who are still living today. And over here you'll see Dr. Raymond Buckland, who is the author of many, many books, including Buckland's Big Blue, which many people consider the definitive book on modern witchcraft. You'll also see Selina Fox. Selina Fox is probably the leading civil rights activist in the Wiccan world. Uh, she is the head of the Circle Tradition of Witchcraft, uh, and also holds the Pagan Spirit Gathering, which is uh, one of the largest and longest-running pagan events in the United States, and is the head of the Lady Liberty League, which, among other things, was involved in the Pentacle Quest, the ten-year legal battle to earn for pagan service people the right to have the pentacle in their tombstone. And here we have Laurie Cabot, the famous witch of Salem. And Madame Cabot has her shop just two buildings up from ours, and she has been absolutely instrumental uh, in uh, witchcraft here in Salem for more than four decades. And Madame Cabot is known for appearing in full robes and makeup, which in fact refers to a religious vow that she had made to the goddess that she would always appear in public as a priestess, and she has kept that vow for many, many years. She has been uh, probably the leading person for bringing witches out of the broom closet in my lifetime, uh, and has always been a strong figure uh, for witches' civil rights in this country. 
And here we have Therese Pendragon, another famous witch of Salem. And Madame Therese uh, has been involved in Salem witchcraft also for many decades. And at the very top of her exhibit, you'll see her marching with her little daughter in the 1978 Salem Parade, which was the first year the witches marched in the parade. Uh, but they've done so ever since, and today they wouldn't consider having the parade without the witches. Uh, for many years, uh, Madame Therese had the Oracle Chamber uh, up the street. Today she reads here at the World of Witches Museum. And down below you will see the famous portrait uh, from National Geographic magazine that shows the Black Doves of Isis, uh, Laurie Cabot's first temple, of which Madame Therese is a member. And you'll see Madame Cabot here and Madame Therese here. And what makes this famous portrait so famous is this blue streak of energy coming across the front. And the photographer, uh, who regularly worked for National Geographic and was quite respected, swore that nothing was done to this film. And yet, right where the magic circle was cast, you see this blue streak of energy. And coming off from it are smaller streaks of energy going to each of the different people who had been part of the circle casting. And this is considered by many people to be one of the few occasions when psychic energy has been captured on film and has not really been able to be refuted in any way. And here we have Abby Willowroot. Abby Willowroot is a very prominent pagan priestess and also a very famous artist, particularly as, as a jeweler. And in fact, nine pieces of Lady Abby's jewelry are in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Uh, Madame Willowroot also runs Willowroot's Real Magic Wand Factory, where she creates magic wands using many of the same techniques that she uses to create her famous jewelry. However, this is not why she's on our wall. She's on our wall because of something completely different, the Goddess 2000 Project. And in the waning years of the last millennium, Abby Willaroot organized many, many, many pagan artists and pagan people around the world to create goddess artwork for the Goddess 2000 Project. And the slogan of the Goddess 2000 Project was a goddess on every block. And to a large extent, they succeeded in producing large amounts of goddess artwork, which was displayed throughout the United States and many other countries around the world, uh, which also was one of the first big social projects in the pagan community that brought people together, regardless of the tradition or even the religion that they came from, because people of all kinds were able to take part in it. Uh, pretty much anyone who recognized a feminine aspect to deity could create goddess artwork and come together with other like-minded people in a way that they had never done before. And in many ways, uh, this was one of the most significant events in modern paganism in being able to build that kind of bridge between people of different traditions. And here we have Oberon Zell Ravenhart, who is the head of the Church of All Worlds, the publisher of Green Egg Magazine, and the head of the Gray School of Wizardry. And Oberon uh, is one of the foremost living wizards in the world today, and he's famous for many, many different things that he's done over the years, including books and artwork, and of all things, unicorns. And Oberon and his wife, Morning Glory, uh, in the 1980s, toured with Ringling and Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, along with their unicorns. And in the photos, you can see some of the little unicorns. And the unicorns were actually a kind of goat. And they bred them in such a way that they had only a single horn. Now, there are all kinds of urban legends about how they did this. And you'll hear horror stories of how they implanted horns into the heads of the poor little goats, uh, which would have been completely financially impossible for them to do. Uh, what they actually did uh, is a trick of animal husbandry, because any two-horned animal will occasionally be born with just a single horn. And any two-horned animal can be coached to have a single horn by simply pushing the proto-horn material together before it actually develops. And so the creation of the unicorns actually didn't hurt the little goats at all and brought a little bit of magic into the world. And here we have our magic room. And on this side of the room, we talk about what's called low magic. Low magic is the use of magic in your everyday life to make your life better. And people do this in many different ways. They do it with herbs and incenses and candles. They do it with spellcraft and divination of all kinds. And as you can see here, there are many examples of stones that are used by Terry Milton, the stone lady, in her divination. What she does is that the many different stones on her carousel of stones all have a different meaning. And she'll read for people depending on which stone they choose. And this is a very archetypal form of divination because what we normally do in divination is that we will assign meanings to many different items and interpret them by how they're chosen at random. And in this way, spirit communicates with us through the interactions of the universe. 
And now on this side of the wall, we have high magic. And high magic is the use of magic for spiritual growth. Ceremonialism, Hermeticism, and Alchemy are three forms of magic that are related to modern witchcraft but are different. They have their origin in late Greco-Roman Egypt, and what they have in common with each other, and also with modern witches, is the teaching as above, so below. And this is the idea that everything in the created world reflects its creator, and that if you want to understand God, the universe, and everything, you can study literally anything in the world around you, and it will reflect this back to you, because the divine plan is inherent in all things and all things in the created world reflect their creator. This is the idea behind divination, and why, for example, a certain stone could have a certain meaning that will tell you something about yourself, or why the lines in your hand would have a meaning, or the stars in the sky, or anything else that's used for divination. We believe they all reflect divine truth back to us. In the room here, you'll see an alchemist, and alchemy is a very much misunderstood uh, discipline. It is a magical discipline, which is also a deeply philosophical discipline. And most people only know alchemists in the context of a bunch of nuts trying to turn lead into gold. And certainly some of them were nuts, and some of them were trying to turn lead into gold. But they were also a deeply philosophical movement. And when they talk about turning lead into gold, for the most part, what they're really talking about is turning the lead of their ordinary life into the gold of spiritual enlightenment. And when they were studying the many natural substances that they did, in fact, study, what they believed is that they were learning more about spirituality through these natural substances because of the idea, again, as above, so below. And now we come to the Witch Hunt Room. And the first thing you'll see in our Witch Hunt Room are these lovely artworks by Lady Bitterwind, the former first elder of the Corellian tradition. And you may say, why are these artworks in the Witch Hunt Room? And the answer is, well, they fit here. And both of these two artworks are about the immortality of the soul, in particular the one on the wall, which is called after the famous poem, Death Shall Have No Dominion, represents the skeleton as the soul going on after death, not the body that is left behind. Because in Wicca, we believe that the soul is immortal. It goes through many different lifetimes, many different incarnations. And so it really kind of seemed to us that this was a good place to start our discussion of witch hunts with the immortality of the soul, because the rest of our conversation is going to be all about death. And um, everybody knows, of course, that we had a witch hunt here in New England, uh, and in that witch hunt, 19 people were hanged, five people died in jail, one person was pressed to death, Tichko lived through it all, uh, and everybody knows that there was a witch hunt in Europe. In Europe, the witch hunt lasted for about 300 years, and many thousands of people died. Uh, the actual number of people who died is very controversial, and it ranges anywhere from estimates of about 100,000 to several million. And nobody really knows because there is no really impartial research on those numbers, but it was certainly many thousands of people. It was a terrible time. Most people think it happened during the Middle Ages. It really has much more to do with the period of the Reformation, but it was several hundred years. What most people don't know is that witch hunts are not a thing of the past. And at this very moment, in parts of the developing world, witch hunts are raging out of control, especially in Africa, where witch hunts are a special problem and have been for the last several years. The worst place for witch hunts in Africa is Nigeria, where many hundreds of people have been persecuted, uh, victimized, and in some cases even killed on accusations of witchcraft. Um, and this is a serious problem in the world today. Not only in, uh, in places like Nigeria and South Africa and other parts of Africa, but even in the United States and Great Britain, there have been cases of African immigrants who have severely abused or murdered their own children because they believe they are witches. Because the worst thing of the African witch hunts is that the Africans have a fixation on the idea of child witches. And in fact, the most notorious of all African witch hunters, the Reverend Helen Upabio, uh, who uh, bills herself as the Lady Apostle, literally teaches that if a child cries at night, it must be a witch. Uh, so we try to take just this few moments to let people know that this sort of thing is still happening in the modern world, and uh, that's our heavy moment for this tour. Now we come to our own witch hunt. And this is our wall of news stories from the witch hunt that we encountered when we moved our school, witchschool.com, the world's largest school of witchcraft, from metropolitan Chicago, where nobody ever noticed us, to rural central Illinois, where we were all they talked about for a good long time. Now, most of the people we met in central Illinois were actually very modern, very open-minded people, and quite a lot of them thought it was actually very cool to have a school full of witches move into town. But there were some of them who got quite upset. Even the larger churches were pretty welcoming. The Methodists were delightful, and the Presbyterians were very supportive. 
but some of the smaller, fringier churches got really upset. And they held pray-ins to try to pray us out of town. Uh, one of the local churches gave us a $1,000 check if we would not move into town, but we did move into town, and so the check is on the wall. Uh, but the good news is we were there for seven years, and nobody's cat ever went missing on Halloween because of us, so hopefully they learned they didn't have so much to be afraid of. Now we come to the artifact room, and our first artifact is Happy Buddha. Happy Buddha. As you can see, our Happy Buddha here is part of our prosperity altar. And Happy Buddhas are part of traditional Buddhism. It's the Buddha Milefo, the Buddha of the coming age. And this particular Happy Buddha has been in my family for many years. He came from Cambodia. He was brought to this country in 1973. And what people do with Happy Buddha is that they keep the image of Happy Buddha to attract happiness and prosperity into their lives. And the idea is that you rub Buddha's belly and make him happy, and he will make you happy with whatever it is you happen to wish for. We always offer people the chance to rub Buddha's belly. Now, over here, we have our first case. The first things in our case over here are in this little shadow box, and they come from the Pentacle Quest. The Pentacle Quest was the 10-year legal battle to earn for Wiccan service people the right to have the Pentacle on their tombstone if they're buried in a national cemetery. Now, interestingly, the military had recognized Wicca as a religion as early as 1976, but the Veterans Administration, which runs the national cemeteries, did not want to recognize Wicca, and it took 10 years of legal fighting to finally get it through. And thanks to Selena Fox and the Lady Liberty League, and also Pete Pathfinder Davis of the Aquarian Tabernacle, and a number of other people who banded together with that legal fight, today Wiccan service people can have the pentacle on their tombstone, and many in fact do. And in the shadow box you'll see a number of different items, including the, uh, the blessed mojo bag that was handed out at rallies to supporters. You'll see the, back, the patch that was worn by supporters of the organization and you'll see the medallion that is worn by people who were involved in that fight. Uh, you'll also see here on the shelf a red, white, and blue mojo bag that was handed out at the ceremony when, it was in fact, when the fight was in fact won. Now, you'll also see a number of other things in our case, including magic wands, and witches really do use magic wands, we just don't use them for very much, but everybody has to have one because they're really cool. You'll see chalices, which are used uh, to make libation offerings and to share toasts and ritual. Uh, you'll see my grandmother's incense burner, uh, which is an example of a particularly nice incense burner. Incense is used at Wiccan rituals. Down below, you'll see athames. And athames are a ceremonial blade that is used to open and close religious ceremonies. And because it's used in a ceremonial way, the athame does not normally have an edge. And in fact, many of them start their lives as letter openers. Uh, and what they represent is the power of thought to cut through things. And as you can see, they come in many different varieties. Down below, you'll see a number of different tarot decks and other divination cards that are used uh, for fortune telling, for divination, uh, whatever you would like to call it. And they range all the way from the very traditional tarot of Marseille to the Rider Waite tarot, which revolutionized tarot reading about 100 years ago, all the way up to the Miss Cleo tarot. For anyone who remembers Miss Cleo, the friendly Jamaican psychic from the 1990s, whose Jamaican accent was never the same in any two television commercials. Here on our mantle, we have a number of interesting items. We have this lovely table favor from a previous witch's ball here in Salem. We also have this black mirror. And this particular black mirror formerly belonged to Lady Crystal, the retired first priestess of the Corellian tradition. And the black mirror is used for vision seeking. It's used in the same way that the bowl of water was used in ancient times, as we discussed at the Oracle of Delphi, and in the same way that crystal balls are more commonly used today. People stare into the black mirror, they go into a light trance, they see visions. And uh, the black mirror is very common in modern Wicca. You will also see Hetty the Phrenology Head. And phrenology was a form of divination that read the bumps on a person's head. When we started the museum, I thought phrenology was pretty much a dead art. I've never actually met a phrenologist, and it's very hard to find good information on phrenology. So I thought it was one of those few forms of divination that just wasn't practiced anymore. But I've been set straight. Apparently, there's a school of phrenology still somewhere in New York State. And so eventually, we'll meet a phrenologist. Up above, you'll see a Ouija board, and Ouija boards are very controversial, and many people are very afraid of them. But as a tool of psychic development, when used properly, uh, they're actually quite, quite useful uh, for a short period in the time that one is learning to be a clairvoyant. Uh, as a parlor game, not such a good idea. Here in our second case, you'll see a number of altar figures. And in modern witchcraft, people will have a patron god or a patron goddess, or both, or several. And they may come from any part of the world, any place in time, depending on how deity speaks to that person. Because we believe 
that deity comes to the person in the way that's right for them, and that every person is different, and so deity must have many, many different names and faces in order to properly communicate with everyone. And in the case here, you'll see everything from the Egyptian Isis, to the Greek Athena, to the Celtic Morian, to the African Yemaya, to the Chinese Kuan Yin, and many others besides, and they still represent only a very small number of the kinds of patron deities that you would see in the modern magical community. And down below you'll see still more divination items, including a tea leaf reader's cup with cheat signs in case the reader's not very good, gypsy witch fortune telling cards, which are similar to, to tarot cards but are different, uh, and the most famous divination item of all time, the Magic 8-Ball. Now, in this case, you'll see a large collection of pagan magazines, and these come mostly from the 1970s and 80s. And back in those days, before the advent of the Internet, this is how the, how the witch community stayed in touch with itself. And these magazines were mostly produced by people at home. They're often called underground publications. Uh, as a general rule, they were typed up on typewriters, taped together with scotch tape, uh, il illustrated by hand with pen and ink, and photocopied and then sent out in the mail. And there were hundreds of these different magazines, and we have a rather large collection of them, of which this is only a small portion. Uh, but some of the ones that you'll see here in the, uh, the case include Circle Network News, which was among the most prominent of the magazines. You'll also see The Wheel of Hecate, which I edited uh, myself. You'll see Harvest, which was a prominent New England magazine of the day. And in these different magazines uh, were articles, news stories, rituals, um, recipes, all sorts of different ways that people communicated. Often they had letters from, uh, from different people who subscribed to the magazines, and it really was the way in which the community communicated before the advent of the Internet. Now today, of course, all of the things that you used to find in the underground magazines you find online. Uh, and in some cases, they're the same people doing it. Most of the actual hard copy magazines have vanished now, although Circle Network News does still continue as Circle Magazine. Um, all the other ones that you see here in the case are no longer in publication. Uh, the probably, other than Circle, the most famous of the magazines are Green Egg and, and the Icean News. And now we enter our temple room. Come on, it's okay. This is our temple. It's called the Temple of Tichuba, and it is an actual working Wiccan temple. We do a ritual at least once a week. Usually we meet on Saturdays. We also meet for special occasions. Uh, and this would be the altar. And if you've ever wondered what a witch's altar looks like, this would be an example. And on the altar, you'll see many of the same things we've talked about at different parts in our tour, including the magic wand, the athame, altar figures, and lots and lots of candles. Over here in... Uh, the corner, you will see an ancestor altar, and this is specifically dedicated to our ancestors to honor them uh, for all that they have done to bring us to where we are. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed our tour, and normally at this point we would take questions, but that would be a little bit hard to do in this format. Uh, and so, we thank you for joining us, and until next time, may you blessed be.